Welcome back, everyone, to track one. Um, your next speaker is Nicola Petrolungo. Um, Nicola is, has um, built web applications for some of the biggest companies in Europe. Um, he's a conference speaker, and he often speaks about processes and best practices. As an Italian, he doesn't like spaghetti code. So please give a big round of applause to Nicola. Thanks for the introduction, uh, thanks for coming and thanks for having me here. And today we are going to talk about security. This is a scary word, always scary word. Let's see if we can make it less spooky. So this talk is about a security code review guide. It's based on the uh, second edition of the code security guide made by the Open Web Application Security Project. And uh, as that guy, guide, this talk doesn't prescribe really a process for performing a security code review, instead provides a guidance on how the effort should be structured and executed. Uh, since I have lots of content to show, I'll go really quickly about myself. I'm Nicola Pietrobongo, lead developer at the Royal Opera House, author of Learning PHP 7 by Pact Publishing, other skills over PHP. I'm also expert in cloud computing, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. You can find me online as Nick Longstone, GitHub, Twitter. I just uh, sent a tweet with the slide, so you can also find the slide already uh, now, from now. Um, quickly, back to the talk. Uh, so I decided to divide this talk into parts. The security code review, we are going to see what it is, why we should do that, and so on. And then there is the OWASP top 10. What are the top 10 vulnerabilities? And what's the interaction with PHP web application? Uh, let's see uh, quickly a definition about secure code review. So secure code review is an announcement to the standard code review practice where, secure con uh, where security considerations are paramount. So it's an announcement, goes in addition to what <clears throat> is the standard code practice, and of course it's about security. Now I'm going to show you some questions, and through this question I'll try to explain more about the security code review guide. The first question is, do I need to review my code for security? I mean, <laughs> I would say hell yeah, because uh, if uh, you don't review your code by security, virtually there is 100% of uh, probability that your code has a security hole. So this was a quick question and also a quick answer. The second question is, is it a manual process? So is it really a manual process? Should I stay there to check all these vulnerabilities in the code? To answer this question, I'm going to show you what's the result of uh, the AppSec uh, survey, uh, USA 2015, the question was which security method is the most effective to check these kind of areas. We have vulnerabilities, privacy, business logic, compliance, and availability. And the methods were, I mean, are source code scanning tools in uh, gold, automated scan in uh, bright blue, manual penetration test in green, and the bar that probably is the most interesting is manual code review in grey. As you can see, manual code review in grey is prominent in most of the areas. Why? Simply because security is about the context. If I don't know how the application works, if I don't know how it behaves, it's very difficult to then run an automated code review on top. So automated tools are not so smart, and a, man, and a human check is always needed. So that's why manual code review is the most effective method. Uh, of course, there are those tools that are static analysis tools that you can uh, try in PHP. They will analyze your code, and they will try to find out what are the most common vulnerabilities. So another question, when can I start with security code review? So here the real uh, question is, um, um, it's about uh, your work workflow. So is your work workflow mature enough to adopt this kind of practice? Let me introduce the concept of uh, capability maturity model. This model shows uh, how actually your software development life cycle how mature is, what's the stage, what is, what's the state of, what's the evolution of your software development life cycle. There are five stages. Let me explain it with some example. So let's imagine you are on a brand new company and in a brand new team. The process, so the workflow of this team, the software development life cycle of this team is chaotic at the beginning. You don't have documentation, everything is a chaos, you try to meet the deadline and hit, uh, yeah, hit, uh, hit the deadline as well. So in that case, you are at the initial state. 
When the process starts to be documented, so you have minimal documentation and you are able to repeat the process, and also some of your teammates is able to repeat the process, you are at the repeatable state. Is, a, is defined when finally is a business standard, so everybody should adopt that process and is well documented. Is capable when actually this process also, uh, you can collect from this process, uh, this process some metrics, so you can start to analyze the process as well. And is uh, called efficient when you start to optimize the process. So here I have a kind of a question for all of you. So the question is, you should understand the, um, where you are, so at which stage uh, your workflow is. So quick question, uh, who uh, thinks uh, is at the initial state? So chaotic process, no documentation, show events? Nobody, that's very good. No one, okay, but it's good anyway. Repeatable state, who feels is at the repeatable state? And uh, capable? Defined? Efficient? Come on, everybody's efficient. Okay. <laughs> anyway, the, 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 the rule is here is um, if you are at least at a repeatable state or defined, you are already able to bring the code security, uh, the security code review <coughs> as part of your process. Of course, you have to consider other factors like uh, the number of uh, uh, developers you, are, you have in the team. If there is just one uh, one-man band, it's very difficult to review by security. Also deadlines uh, are, a, are an important factor because uh, you can have business pressure and so on. Another suggestion is uh, you should use the right tool uh, to review the code by security. With the right tool, I mean uh, some tool that can provide some kind of uh, knowledge base, so has um, some uh, historical record. Why? Because it's useful for new members, but can be also be useful for you to track uh, the progress what, the, what was the, for, for instance, what was the security issue, how it was solved, and so on. Uh, here I have to, just a quick tip, a personal suggestion. I like to use the same tool I'm using for standard code review. If, for instance, I'm using GitHub, pull request and something like that, I like to continue to use the same kind of tool because it's something that I already know. You should also decide when to review. Decide when to review, it means at which stage of your workflow. Imagine you are working on a Kanban board, you are going to have, uh, I don't know, a to-do stage, initial uh, in-progress stage, then you have um, uh, review, test, uh, UAT, and, and so on, for instance. Um, when you are going to add this security code review? I would suggest uh, add the security code review straight after, or in the same place you perform the standard code review. Because if you push towards the ends of, the, of your workflow, this kind of process, you are going to miss that. So try to keep it uh, closer to the normal and to the standard code review. Then there is another concept, that is the concept of the core security team. So security code review is a bit different than the standard code review. In the standard code review, you can even follow pattern like code smells. With these code smells and this pattern, I can just memorize this pattern. And even a junior developer can potentially review a code. In security, it's not like that. You should be aware about the security risk. So you should be what is called a subject matter expert. You should be trained about that. So there is this, this uh, concept of the core security team that you can find also in other book and in other documentation. This is the team that is able and should be, uh, I mean, should be able to review the code, of course. Um, my suggestion is try anyway, perhaps. Try to find out in your team if you have senior developer also passionate about security, a push over them. Uh, and of course, if you need some training, just ask your business to provide some training for that. Um, since uh, the core, uh, the code security, the um, security code review is an additional stage and will be an additional stage in your pipeline, in your workflow. Your, capacity, your team capacity possibly will shrink a little bit. So, uh, again, possibly the business or your company won't uh, really like uh, this additional state, won't, won't really like this kind of delay. If this happens, just show something like that to your boss, and I believe they will change their idea. It's a recently, um, uh, actually, it's a kind of reason, 10th of January, uh, careful one house, was a WordPress issue. So, at the end of the story, uh, security is a measure of maturity in a web application, and I strongly believe that any serious web application, also high traffic web application, should have or should try to have this process in place. Where to start? We saw briefly a little bit about core security team, but really how I can start. 
Um, probably those questions can help. What I would suggest here is uh, um, have a meeting within your team and try to answer those questions within your team. The question are who should review the code? Um, what to review? Because not all the feature probably needs a security code review. If I have to change uh, a text, possibly I don't need to run a security code review for that. When? When you should review? We saw when. We said um, um, try to review straight after the normal, the standard code review. And also where? Where in the meaning of which environment? This is an example. It's just an example. So on the left side I have the question, on the right I try to have some answers. Uh, who? Can be an internal member, can be an, an external member. Internal member, of course, of this core security team. External member as a third party supplier. I can even ask someone to come in and review my code. What? What I should review? I can review a single feature. I can review even the entire web application. It, it's a possibility. It's going to be crazy in an agile <laughs> way, but it's a possibility. <coughs> When? Again, try to review when you, uh, after, straight after you review, uh, you run your uh, standard code review, but can be even a daily task, a weekly task, or a monthly task. Where? Where in the meaning of which environment? We saw you need a tool that provides some historical data, but here is also which environment. It's strange to say which environment because um, you think about code review as I have to look at the code and I have to understand how it works. In security, to understand how it works, you so sometimes you need an application up and running. That's why you probably need an environment. So when you have some clear idea, and when you um, uh, um, expose all the possibility, you can start to connect the dot and build your own process. You can say an internal, an internal member uh, <coughs> should only review single uh, feature, uh, and the review task, so in the same uh, time in which uh, we are performing the standard code review, in the local environment. Or I can uh, ask an external member to come uh, and review the entire web application monthly. So it's up to you then to shape uh, your own process. Another help, apart from this question, can uh, come from a checklist. You can have a checklist. This is an extract or of uh, four or five pages of checklist from the OWASP code review uh, guide. So it's a very long checklist. Here I have a personal opinion about checklist um, because if it's too long and too big, it's difficult to maintain, difficult to run. If you want to write your own checklist, you go, you're probably going to miss some vulnerabilities or some checks. So the problem about checklist, uh, do not take it, uh, I mean, do not treat it as, as a Bible. Be a little bit flexible about checklist, but can, can be a help. Can also help you to understand what to review and what to don't. Um, another ex another um, uh, help can come from the threat modeling. This is a document that is not strictly part of the uh, uh, security code review, so it's not part of the security code review process, but it's something that can help during the process. This document just describes the possible threat uh, that are on your web application. So our possible threat is an hypothetical document. Uh, in, I'm going to go really quickly on this document because it's not strictly part of the security code review, but I want to show you because I think it's important. So um, in order to create this document, you have to uh, go through three steps. The first step is, is to decompose your application. You're going to have a graph. Also, the shape of this graph has a meaning. So every shape has uh, its own meaning. For instance, here I have, I have a user that uh, log in uh, in some web application and then has uh, some access to some data from some database. So first step, you decompose your application, you have this nice graph. The second step is to think as a malicious user, is to think as a hacker, and try to identify possible vulnerabilities. So you can say, for our business, it's uh, very dangerous that the malicious user views confidential information. When you identify this vulnerability, you can even rank the vulnerability. I'm using here a rank model go called uh, DREAD. So damage, reproducibility, exploitability, affected users, discoverability. So you can end up with a score that will uh, actually rank and score the type of vulnerability. And at the end, when you have all uh, the graphs, all the threads and everything, you can start to also to provide suggestions. And those suggestions are going to be very useful during the review process. As I said, this is not a document that you have to run and uh, create during the security code review. It's something that probably you have to, uh, yeah, you probably should, should, uh, should create before everything. Can help because you have a graph, you can understand how the application works, you can also have suggestion, so you have a clear idea about what to review. So, a little recap of this first part. 
you must review for security. I strongly believe that. Okay, probably I'm too bold to say you must. I should say you, you should. But anyway, <clears throat> I strongly believe you, you, you really uh, should or must. Mainly, it's a manual process. Should be run by uh, software, uh, sorry, uh, subject matter expert. So someone that actually knows about vulnerabilities, or as I suggested, find out some senior member that also knows uh, uh, how the application work and want to know know more about vulnerabilities. And of course, you have to try to define your own process. Uh, also, try to uh, use these kind of suggestions. Now we are entering in the second part of our talk and is uh, the OWASP top 10. So what are the top 10 vulnerabilities and uh, what's the interaction with the PHP app web application? Here I'm gonna follow a kind of pattern. I'm gonna show the vulnerability. Uh, sometimes I have some examples, sometimes I don't. And then I'm gonna actually try to, um, to, to show what to review because of course this is the security code review talk. The first vulnerability is injection. injection so with injection, a malicious user can inject data or code in a web application, changing its behavior. So we can end up with uh, uh, data exposure, elevated privileges, and all these kind of uh, vulnerabilities. The most common injection is considered SQL injection. Here I have a quick example. So starting from the line no, number, uh, number one, uh, let's imagine we have this input that comes from, uh, from somewhere, can be a form, but it, now it's not really important where it comes from. So the input is one or one equal one. It's an always true condition. One is always equal one, it's an always true condition. Line number three, I read that with MySQL I real escape string, I'm uh, pretty safe. So I'm using MySQL I real escape string, escaping the ID value. My query looks like select all from users where ID equal the content of the variable ID. But I end up, uh, at the end I end up with uh, be vulnerable to SQL injection because my SQ, uh, SQL query will uh, look like select all from users where ID equal one or one equal one. So it's a select all mainly. So uh, I don't know if you spot the error. Someone knows where, where the error is. Yeah, this is uh, uh, a statement, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> but yeah, but there is, uh, there is also something uh, actually in the query that can prevent all this mess. Uh, here, mainly, I missed a single quote around this bar. If I had single quote, I would pass one uh, or one equal one in a single quote and the select uh, I mean, uh, is not correct. So I won't be able to uh, kind of hack this, uh, this query. Let's see another example with PDO, because I read on some blog that PDO is more secure, is more efficient. So the line number one, I'm setting up uh, my database to use uh, this character set, GBK. It's not a uh, gourmet burger kitchen, but uh, I mean, it's a character set that uh, supports Chinese character. So I'm, I'm using Chinese character. Line number two, I have this strange uh, input, again, that comes from somewhere. And I have this, uh, again, this nasty one equal one. My query looks like the one before. Select uh, all from users where name equal something limit one. I'm using PDO prepare statement, executing the query, and I end up again with SQL injection. Select all from users where name equal Chinese character or one equal one. I even uh, en uh, injected a comment. So I'm even commenting limit one. So uh, here, again, even PDO didn't really protect us. So what to do? Should I cry? Should I no, no, go back to <laughs> do, I do not use database uh, in my life anymore? So that, that's uh, what's, the, what's the solution here? So if you are using PHP 7, probably you heard about this uh, bulletproof uh, function called uh, SQL Injection Guard. Who heard about that? OK, who? <laughs> doesn't exist. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> it doesn't exist. <laughs> so the, this function doesn't exist. <laughs> Sorry for, for who, who raised the hand. Uh, the, the, the <laughs> I don't know if I can continue, but so, um, well, okay, it was a prank. Sorry about that. But anyway, the point here is uh, there is no such a function, so we cannot really save against the SQL injection. You have to review uh, what you do. So review the user input. You review always the input. Not only check the type, the length, the format, but also check the, the range 
we always forgot about the range. You can go in overflow, you can fill up the database with a lot of data. And never trust the user input. Okay, this is a really easy suggestion. Use store procedure with the parameterized statements. We saw some uh, uh, lack in the PDO and uh, possibly in store procedure, but it's still, uh, PDO is still considered with store procedure and para parameterized statement. It's still considered first citizen to fight against SQL injection. Um, use the correct character set, as we saw uh, this kind of GBK uh, made some mess. UDFA, line one, ASHI. Or you can even implement multiple layers of validation, so you can double check the action afterwards. Uh, and on our top 10, number two, we have broken authentication. Here uh, is when uh, a malicious user um, uses some flaws in your authentication system or your session management as well and impersonate another user. Some example, um, yeah, one easy example is missing timeout to log out a user. So imagine I'm on some internet cafe, if internet cafe still exists, as a public place, so let's say I'm, in, I'm on a public place, I'm on, my, on, on this kind of uh, public laptop or public desktop, I'm logged in on my bank account, the bank account uh, uh, website doesn't perform a timeout, I close my browser, some other user come in, reopen the browser, the session is still active because there is no timeout. Weak password, so weak password can uh, again lead to uh, someone that tries uh, some random password or even if you're using uh, some default password for some default system. Um, cookie session served under HTTP, of course, it's under HTTP, so it's in clear. Someone can sniff. If I'm on a public Wi-Fi, the router is hacked, I can sniff the cookie, I can spoof it. Login page without rate limit or log is another example. I mean, there are thousands of examples. In this case, it's mainly to try to prevent brute force attack or password guessing attack. Um, so, um, what to review in these cases? You should review, of course. The login should be only available over TLS, so encrypted connection, HTTPS. Consider to lock account or rate limit for failing attempts, if someone tries. You should also review uh, the way you store the password that you're handling the passwords. So check the function, the right cryptographic techniques. Uh, we are going to see uh, cryptography in a bit. Create cryptographically strong session ID. This is very important because I always see session IDs like eight characters, 20 characters is considered secure. This algorithm, SHA-2, that is 256 bits, so it's very long session ID. Proper message for invalid login. I had a slide for that, but I removed the slide for, to do not uh, uh, disclose the hack I just discovered two weeks ago. Anyway, I found this, uh, this login, uh, was a social platform. I found this uh, login system. I was able to randomly put a uh, an email, and the output was like, uh, this user doesn't exist. So you are giving me an information about who's registered and who's not. Also, the password. I, I tried to put some passwords. It was like, this password is not the correct for this user. So you're also telling me that this, this password is not correct for, for that user. I can't even try. Again, the, 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 the message should be always generic. Like, uh, if uh, in our database is present this uh, combination, you... Um, Something like that. <clears throat> so always generic uh, messages for, in, for uh, incorrect uh, login. Let's see, this is a, um, now we are going to be, uh, you are, we are going to go in uh, something very uh, crucial for PHP. Uh, okay, uh, this is broken authentication, so we have to talk about cookies. This is the function uh, used by PHP to set the cookie. In order to fulfill the requirements uh, and to have uh, some secure uh, cookie, we have to set the secure flag and HTTP only flag both to true. A secure flag will um, uh, allow the session cookie to be uh, transmitted only over HTTP connection. HTTP only will prevent browser scripting languages like uh, JavaScript to access to the cookie. This is very important because if you open and if you handle the session with JavaScript languages, you are open to another billion of vulnerabilities. Of course, if you are using a framework, the framework wraps this function on a higher level, be sure that you have those two flags in place. Now, this is a very interesting topic because here I'm gonna speak about the lifetime of a session. So we saw before also that lifetime is a parameter of the previous, previous uh, function. And lifetime, so cookie lifetime, is an absolute value and is the number of, um, of seconds 
uh, in which the cookie is still uh, valid, so it's not expired. The default value in PHP is zero. Again, it's an absolute value. If I put uh, 20 minutes, after 20 minutes, the cookie, the session cookie, will disappear from the, from the browser. So what happens if I store also the session on server side? And what happens uh, if I store the session on my server on server side? Happen these nasty things. We have uh, GC max lifetime that is not an absolute value. It's a uh, relative value. Default is 24 minutes. That means 24 minutes uh, from the last user action. And again, uh, um, here the definition is, is the number of seconds after which data can be cleaned up. So it's kind of flagged as uh, can be cleaned up. So even if uh, this max lifetime will expire, the session will still remain in my uh, server. The PHP garbage collector works in a very strange way, and uh, there is 1% of probability that we'll actually remove your session server side after uh, this value is expired. So PHP doesn't handle uh, this kind of expiration on server side. Doesn't have any function. On uh, kind of, uh, let me pass this term, on front side, so on the browser, the cookie will disappear. On the server side, you can still have an active session. That's the problem. How to deal with that? One solution is, uh, okay, you can create your own function. Easy, I mean, easy, probably not, but you can create your own function or don't store the session uh, over the disk, so on the server. Also, it's a solution that probably lately doesn't work uh, uh, anymore because it doesn't scale. If uh, you're familiar with cloud computing, usually you have a couple of instances of a couple of servers, so you cannot store in one server and do not store in the other one because you're not gonna have the, the session. So, a um, solution is to use uh, to store the session, for instance, in a database. One product that uh, I found helpful is um, I'm using uh, um, Amazon Web Services. I found the helpful uh, DynamoDB that actually is uh, probably has been created for that. And DynamoDB is a database. I can store the session in the database. as also a time to live value that I can set. I can synchronize this time to live value with the cookie lifetime, and I'm going to be 100% sure that the session will disappear, uh, both on the browser and also on my server. Number three of our top ten is sensitive data exposure. Okay, here we are talking about um, data leaks. So sensitive data is, um, such as credit card information, user information, addresses, and so on. And here now we are going to see something about cryptography and encryption. Um, one thing that you should, should, you should know, you have to know, is uh, you have two levels of protection that you can apply. One is called in-transit protection. So it's the, just the communication between the client and the server or the communication between the server and other API. So it's the in-transit protection. The other one is at rest level. Uh, sorry, rest uh, level. So it's inside your application. What to do uh, to protect in-transit uh, communication? The website should be only over HTTPS. I'm not sure if there is someone with the website still in HTTP. I, 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 had, I experienced this problem. But anyway, the website should be only over HTTPS. You should also consider to use uh, TLS internally, so not only uh, from the client and the server. Imagine you have a server, a private um, cloud, and you have internal communication with APIs. You can even implement HTTPS internally for internal communication. Um, again, um, it's about um, um, certificates as well. So TLS, you should have TLS 1.2, the 1.3 is under review. You know, Hopefully, we're going to be released soon. You should have a fully qualified domain name in your certificate. So do not use something like wildcard uh, domains, like star.mydomain.co.uk. It doesn't really, uh, it's not considered really secure. There are providers that uh, allow you to list multiple fully qualified domains for one certificate. Of course, we spoke briefly uh, previously about uh, cookies and session is also about security, I mean, sensitive data exposure is in some way related to that, because if I have the session of someone else, I can steal uh, the data. So we already covered this point. And of course, do not put sensitive data in the URL. Now, question for everyone. Forgot your password link. Who put the email address in the forgot your password link? It's considered bad practice. Instead, you should use a token, possibly, if you want to be super pro, a token that is time-based, that's something like that. Um, more suggestion, don't create custom cryptographic library. Use the salt long enough. This is uh, if you want to store passwords in the database. 
So don't be a superhero and think you can create a, a cryptographic library out of the box. <laughs> use salt, oh sorry, uh, use salt uh, long enough. Salt is always suggested. We like salt probably also in the food. It's also suggested <laughs> here in PHP. If you say something about MD5 or SHA-1 in your code, MD5 was, so, uh, was used a lot, I have to say, years ago, a red flag, because it's considered no, not secure. So at least SHA-2 algorithm to, um, to encrypt the uh, data. Um, so what are the cryptographically secure pseudo-random number generation function? In PHP 7, we have random bytes, a random int, so, uh, in order to create secure uh, pseudo-random, um, um, yeah, secure pseudo-random number, you can use only, you should use only random bytes, a random int for PHP 7, and you should only uh, use random compat, is a polyfill, so is a library, uh, available on packages and so on, for PHP 5. Everything else is not secure. Rand, empty rand, nothing, nothing else. <coughs> Number four, <clears throat> this is about XML, it's called XML external entities. This is about not Excel, XML uh, uh, if you have a client, so uh, if you are consuming an API, but if you are creating an XML API with some XML payload. I'm not sure how many of you has experienced this thing, so how many of you, for, for instance, uh, um, build some uh, SOAP uh, uh, API, show events just to make me... Damn, it's pretty, <laughs> I thought it was less. <laughs> I, I, I wanted to go a little bit faster on this one, but probably I can't. So, uh, uh, mainly uh, here there is an issue because uh, it's how mainly XML work. Uh, this is an example of a hack. On this line, I have an entity called XXE that calls an external entity. So, this is a call to an external file, it can be a file uh, uh, that I spotted inside my system, can be even an URL, can be mainly everything. And then I'm injecting this XXE inside the, the XML payload. So what happened? Uh, what happened when uh, this got uh, resolved by the, um, the XML loader? The content of this password will be in clear inside this tag. This is how it works. Um, so most of the also PHP implementation, simple XML, DOM, uh, are based on lib XML. To prevent XML external entities, so this kind of uh, resolution, you should disable the entity loader with this function. Leave by XML, disable entity loader. There is not really another strong suggestion that I could give. I read other documentation about other suggestions, but this is the only one that really works to, um, again, to kind of uh, avoid this kind of resolution. If you cannot implement these things, because possibly can break your code, and, and it does sometimes, of course, you have to review the implementation, the load, the filtering, sanitize the input, never trust the input, and so on. You can, because XML is a strong, um, I mean, has a strong schema, is a standard, you can even try to um, create some validation against uh, a XML <coughs> schema that you already have. Um, number five of our top ten is a broken access control. Let's see an example to understand more what it is. Here, a user um, found a vulnerability on ads.twitter.com. So this user uh, was able to delete his own credit card via this link. As you can see at the end, there was an ID. This was the ID of uh, his information, his credit card information. Then he tried to change this ID, and he was able to delete also someone else's credit card. <laughs> so. <clears throat> Let's see another example to clarify more this kind of concept and uh, what can happen. Okay, this is a real uh, uh, silly example, also a simple example, but it's pretty clear. Let's imagine I'm on my bank account, so I'm on my bank uh, website, and I want to download my bank statement. Let's imagine this bank has a folder with all the bank statement I already pre-rendered uh, as a PDF. So I have this link, secure bank, whatever, and statement, and ID, one, two, three, this ID, directly is referencing the PDF and there is no other authentication layer in the middle. So as you can imagine, if I just tweak a little bit the ID, I can download someone else's bank statement. That's broken access control. There is no other access control in the middle here. So what you should review here, you should map out all the location where user inputs uh, are used to reference object directly. It's not only about PDF, 
it's about database row. The ID can be a database row, can be an action, can be even an action, can be a file, can be an application page, can be everything. Another suggestion is uh, you should review every entry point and function authorization, like uh, APIs. Um, this is a very important topic because um, uh, previously, probably, so this is about you should record the ownership over the generic CRUD operation. Here is uh, a mindset about uh, how you should design your application. Usually we tend to uh, say, okay, I have this credit card information, I should be able to create credit card information, read, update and delete. It's not like that. You should think uh, before about the ownership. Who, sh who, own, who owns this credit card information? Is the user, so only that user should be able then to perform this action. So it's kind of a little bit, uh, flips a little bit the mindset about how you design the application. It's first about the ownership of the data and then the action over that data. And of course, you should implement an efficient uh, role-based access control. Efficient in the meaning, uh, not so many roles, uh, but also efficient in the meaning of um, if you see malicious activity, you should be able to revoke a role uh, very quickly. Otherwise, it's not efficient in your system and you cannot mitigate the possible vulnerability. Security misconfiguration. Here is about uh, application, even external application that, uh, that they have some interaction with your system that are misconfigured and they can lead to, to some vulnerabilities. Can be a framework, can be web server, we saw something about database and so on. I have an example that uh, is kind of related, but probably doesn't really fit in, uh, this, um, in this area. This um, pretty, pretty actually pretty um, recent. GitHub um, had this DDoS attack, 10 minutes, uh, seven terabyte of data against the GitHub, just because there was memcache public endpoint configured improperly. Wasn't a security uh, so there, there wasn't a security issue with memcache, was just not configured properly, that's it. So here I don't want to talk about database or application or framework configuration, I am just go pretty quickly and I want to talk about what are the two PHP best friends, or what I consider the two PHP best friends that are uh, uh, web servers, are Apache and Nginx. So about Apache, <clears throat> this, uh, I'm going to show a few examples. Of course, I cannot cover all the misconfiguration about Apache and PHP. I'm going to show a few examples. One uh, common mistake is to open the folder to everything with some kind of allow all and so on. So if you don't put like option minus indexes, your folder can possibly be listed via URL. I can even download it and, uh, and check whatever you have in your folder. Another quick example is uh, if you have, again, a public folder uh, let's imagine you have a public, public folder that uh, uh, holds and stores uh, the assets, uh, images uh, or images or whatever. Do not, do not uh, uh, open this folder um, to everything. Try to filter what you should expose. This is uh, um, in accordance of a principle called uh, the principle of least privileges or principle of minimal privileges. That means expose only what you really need. Don't do an allow all. You should do a deny all by default. That's secure. Deny all by default and uh, slowly then open what you really need. The same uh, kind of things we can see in Nginx. Here I have a public folder and I'm only uh, grant the access to the index.php. I mean, this is pretty easy because usually if you use a framework, uh, for instance, Symfony has app.php. We have this concept of front controller. You always hit that uh, app.php or index.php, so you can just expose that PHP file, and you, you can return 404 for the rest. Um, I went pretty quickly. I, as you can imagine, there are a lot to say about configuration. I would like to suggest uh, to check uh, the OWASP website about Apache configuration, because are pretty, um, sometimes are pretty challenging. About Nginx, I found this tool called uh, Gixi. It's a static analysis tool that can check your configuration. So you can run it, check your configuration, and you can be pretty safe. Number seven, cross-site scripting. <clears throat> so here, a malicious user injected some code over a web page, and another user is affected by that. Um, quick example, here we have Equifax website. It's an old, uh, uh, it's not a current vulnerability. It was pretty old, this one. Uh, there was a form, through this form it was possible to inject some code, some script. And it was also possible to show some pop-up. Uh, I mean, if you can understand what, what, what can be wrong, I can even 
um, uh, pop in some login uh, system and steal uh, the credential. So mainly injection is about uh, input which possibly makes its way in the HTML output. It's always about you have some input that then for some reason makes, it, makes its own way on the HTML output. You should review every single part of the code that has this kind of stuff. It can be about error messages that redisplay the user input. Imagine a registration form, you have an email, the email is wrong, you are redisplaying that single field, so the email uh, gmail.com is wrong. Can be, again, can be a form, can be a URL parameters. You are using a URL parameters and then these parameters in some way um, is redisplaying and, and, uh, in, into the web page. Can be any different field, can be mainly probably everything. But also can be a tag, image source, iframe, BG sound, I'm not sure if someone still uses it. But anyway, anyway, it's a suggestion. Uh, why I should review image source? Why I should review the attribute source of, your, of my image tag? Uh, example, imagine you have a resize uh, PHP function. So in the source, I have actually a PHP file. I have resizer.php, question mark, size medium, and um, image URL something. So I have also the image URL. <clears throat> I can possibly, with JavaScript or with some other scripting language, change this URL, and I can show apples and oranges on the website. So uh, uh, here is about uh, checking all the source and all the, the um, all, uh, actually it's possible also to have some kind of uh, on-click event, so JavaScript event, on-click event, this kind of event also are kind of evil. Um, I'm sorry to say that, but most of the time it's about JavaScript, most of the time. Um, those are the functions that are considered secure when you have to uh, handle untrusted data. So node the text content, create text node, set attribute, and so on. So uh, mainly here, what they doing this uh, this function? Uh, simply they um, uh, they passing the value as a text. So imagine I am a, I'm a malicious user and I want to inject a link, a href, whatever. This link, if I'm using text content, will be passed as text, so won't be clickable. I will see on the web page a href, but I cannot click on it. That's why you should try to use only those functions. You should use only those functions when you're handling untrusted data. Number eight, insecure deserialization. <clears throat> this is uh, a new uh, topic because, uh, so the OWASP top 10, the latest one was the 2013, this is the 2017. This has been introduced uh, in 2017. And is about, uh, so on the PHP side, side is about unserialized, the function unserialized. I'm, sh um, I'm going to show you a um, very silly example. Here, imagine you have a cookie. In this cookie, there is a serialized array. This is uh, the username. This is the role. So you're actually leaving the role in the cookie in clear, in kind of clear, because the, the, if you serialize something, you don't, really, uh, you don't really encrypt something. So a malicious user can just change the role, change also the name, and have different privileges. Okay, this is a very silly example. Let's see something more interesting. I have a class, class bad class, public uh, variable, foo, public function, destruct. So this is a magic method. I'm echoing something, I'm bad. I'm serializing the bad class. Then I dump the, the value of uh, the unserialized function. So what, what do you think is going to happen here? So possibly we can guess that this struct will be called at the end because uh, at function uh, at the class destruction. So what do you think is going to be the output of this var dump? It's going to be something like that. I am bad is called at the beginning. Then there is the serialized object, and then there is I am bad any again. So every magic method, if you serialize a PHP class, will be called. You understand that it's very dangerous because I can inject, uh, I can even change the, the, the values of the current class. I can do mainly everything. Let's see uh, actually what the php.net documentation says about that. Unserialization, sorry, unserialization can result in code being loaded and executed due to object instantiation and auto-loading. And a malicious user may be able to exploit this. We know that in PHP 7 we have unserialized with a second parameter, 
doesn't prevent this issue. It doesn't prevent this issue. So what you should do, actually, you should review how to use unserialized and its implementation. In my opinion, don't use unserialized. If it's so dangerous, it caused so much trouble, and also in the past caused a lot of trouble. Even I think PHP 7.1 had a bug on uh, unserialized. <coughs> Try to do not use it. Simply, you can use a not kind of active uh, magic transformation with JSON encode and JSON decode. So you have passive data, not, not an active class that can do nasty things. Let's go ahead and see the number nine, use components with known vulnerabilities. This is pretty easy, pretty straightforward. So component with known vulnerabilities, we are talking about plugin, libraries, um, everything that you can uh, adopt and you can have in your, inside your web application. So uh, the suggestion is pretty easy. I'm going to be a bit fast on this. Before to adopt a library, check uh, if it's uh, well maintained, if there are uh, regular basis, uh, I mean releases in a regular basis, and so on. Um, this is also valid for a WordPress plugin. If you have a WordPress website, check the plugin. Um, and you also need to be aware about the, the integration, because if the integration is, is bad, also the code can be exposed to vulnerabilities. What to do? <coughs> what can be helpful here? We have uh, SensorLab Security Checker that is very helpful because it's, a, it's again, is a static kind of static analysis tool that can check uh, your composer.json um, uh, libraries and uh, check if you have some library with known vulnerabilities. Another help, to be honest, is just to check uh, some website like themitri.org. You, uh, you can search for the plugin, uh, the WordPress plugin you are going to use. You can search over there and you can see if there is uh, some well-known vulnerabilities. And finally, after uh, on uh, our top 10, there is the number 10, insufficient logging and monitoring. Again, this has been introduced in 2017 by the community, the community because uh, if you don't have uh, sufficient logging or you are not monitoring your web application, you're going to get hacked and you probably will discover after one year. We know uh, something recently happened in this, in this way. So I don't really have an example, it's just a bunch of suggestions, <clears throat> but are uh, pretty um, probably easy to implement. You should review the input, oh sorry, you should re review the input validation failures and log input validation failures. So if uh, I'm, I try to log in and this fails, I, also, uh, add, I should also add a log for output validation failures. So input is uh, when the user does something, output in the meaning of uh, some data that you extract from the database, you possibly parse in some way and you output to the user. Why you should log also this process? Because probably your database got hacked, the data is corrupted. So you should also log this kind of stuff if something uh, goes bad, of course. Authentication successes and failures, you have to log that. Never log password, please. Never log password nowhere. Then I explain you why, actually you can ask me afterwards. Uh, of course, you have to um, uh, review also the session management failures because probably someone tried to hack the session as well. Application errors and system events like runtime error and so on. And because we are uh, now talking about GDPR and everything, also legal, legal and opt-ins like personal data usage and consent. So this was the number 10 of the OWASP top 10. Of course, the tips that you saw during my talk are not sufficient to cover the security of your web application. So please, go deeper into the topic. I hope you are going to be now a little bit peckish in the meaning, uh, not because it's tea time, but like food for thought. So <laughs> I'm gonna, I hope also you try to implement this kind of um, suggestion and you try also to adopt, uh, possibly from Monday and so on, the security code review as a process in your team workflow. I'll leave you with the last thought, that is, uh, security is uh, not a process, but a, it's not a product, but a process. <laughs> I started to make it wrong. Thank you. <laughs>